Hey there everybody, this is Doc and uh, the sun has finally started to go down there and uh, the heat of the day has dissipated and this really is the best time of day uh, along with early morning if it is hot out to go ahead and walk your pets uh, to get them out of the excessive heat and I figured this would be also a good time to uh, take a nice little drive as uh, things have started to cool down so what are some other things that uh, potentially you can do to help prevent any kind of heat stress or stroke in your pets this summer season? Why don't you come on a drive with me and let's find out. Thanks again for coming along on this drive with me through the beautiful countryside here in northeastern PA as uh, uh, we enjoy a wonderful evening drive. I apologize as I am probably going in and out of lightness here uh, just because of the angle of the sun right now as I drive. But, uh, you know, we are here in the beautiful endless mountain region of northeastern Pennsylvania. And I figured uh, with the temperatures skyrocketing as they have been across the country and with the predictions of a very, very hot summer in certain areas, I figured this would be a good time to remind remind everybody about the perils of heat for your pets uh, and some things that you can do to make sure that you keep them as uh, heat stress free as possible uh, throughout this summer because really I mean we as veterinarians we do see a lot of these heat related uh, illnesses every year and I would say probably if you talk to veterinarians 90-ish percent of them are probably preventable maybe even more and that's what we're about really as veterinarians we want to prevent the problem before it becomes a problem so uh, that's why I figured I would take a little bit of time on this drive uh, to talk a little bit about uh, just heat stress in animals in general what to look for what you can do and you know, again some general tips that we always remind pet owners of uh, to keep their pets as happy and healthy as possible this summer I'm not really going to focus too much on large animals, uh, you know, obviously there are things you can do to help keep them cool, uh, but talk to your veterinarian about those. Uh, sometimes there are specific things related to horses or livestock that you can do that is kind of a little bit of a separate topic, so I'm going to focus more on the dogs and cats, obviously, because that is what I have more of a specialty in, and that is usually what we see more of issues uh, as far as heat stroke goes uh, in most veterinary hospitals. So let's jump right in, and of course, the first thing to be aware of anytime you're dealing with one of these issues uh, or heat issues is to know the pet that you have, and we're talking mostly on the dog side here. Remember, dogs come in all shapes and sizes, all sorts of different breeds, all sorts of uh, different hair coats, all of that stuff, and obviously, there are certain dog types that are going to, I guess the best way of putting it, um, have much more trouble in the heat. Uh, and of course, the first thing we think of is the northern breeds. So your Malamutes, your St. Bernard, your Newfoundlands, um, you know, dogs of that nature that have those really thick coats and those really heavy undercoats. Um, obviously, they are bred for cooler, colder climates, and, and that coat is there for a reason to help keep them uh, help keep them warm. That can be a detriment in the summer. Uh, you know, they certainly can overheat quite easy. It's the equivalent of us kind of, you know, having a fur coat on. And remember, dogs and cats, they really don't sweat. They may sweat a little bit through their paws, but that's about it. Um, so really, the only way they dissipate heat, uh, the main way, is through panting. And they dissipate a lot of heat through their lungs and, and the hot air that they're expelling. Um, and if you have that extra layer of insulation for that fur, that's just that much more heat that they have to suffer with to try to expel. Um, 
and the, you know, so obviously keep that in mind. You want to be careful though in not shaving those dogs down because the, the, you can a little bit, you want to talk to your vet about this because every breed is a little different, but if you shave too much and you actually shave out that undercoat, you actually could be causing more harm than good because there is a little bit of an actual air circulation, air conditioning effect with that undercoat the way it's designed. So if you are going to think about shaving down, you know, your, your northern breed for the summer, talk to your veterinarian before doing it just to make sure that, you know, uh, you know you're doing the right thing and you're not going to cause more problems by doing that even though you think you're potentially helping them. The other kind of class that we worry about are those pushed in nose dogs, uh, the ones that everybody loves, the Pugs, the Frenchies, the Bostons, um, bulldog, Bulldogs, you know, those types of breeds. And they really have kind of two things going against them. The first of which, and we talked about how really most dogs cool themselves off a lot by panting. Um, the first thing is that their nasal openings, or what we call their nares, usually are narrow. So they can't move as much air normally through their nose uh, as, a, as a regular dog, say a Labrador or, or something like that with a normal sized nose would. So that's their first strike. The second is they usually tend to have narrower breathing airways in general due to a lot of reasons. Um, and this can make it that much harder for them to, to pant and, uh, and to dissipate that heat. So it's much more easy for them to get overworked and when they're panting excessively hard, that can lead to also a little bit of excess swelling in the throat area sometimes, which can make it harder for them to breathe, which just exacerbates this whole heat cycle. So, you know, they are definitely ones that you want to be very, very careful with. Uh, if you possibly can, you obviously want to have them avoid any kind of heat stress situations because they can overheat and go into heat stress and heat stroke issues quite easily and quite quickly. So, you know, know your breed, make sure that you have those precautions in place. Um, now, when we're talking about all pets, obviously, in very, very hot weather, and when we're talking about hot weather, the other thing you want to remember is we're not always, it's the same thing as humans. We're not talking just about the temperature, but we, we want to look at the heat index here uh, because it, it affects animals the same way as it does us. If it's very hot, even if it's not super hot, say in like the mid 80s, but you've got a really high humidity, that jacks that heat index up and makes it feel like it's a lot warmer than it is. And it has the same effect on us, you know, and it does as it does our pets. So they can have much more trouble dissipating that heat, obviously, uh, and getting that evaporative effort from the panting going, especially if it's incredibly, incredibly humid. Um, so you definitely want to be aware of all of those types of things. So some basic principles that we tell everybody and everybody should always remember is, you know, one, you really don't want to have them out in the middle of the day when it's it's the hottest time of, of day out. If you're going to walk them, take them on shorter walks, usually in the morning and the evening. If they do have to go out multiple times a day, really try to make sure that it's very, very short periods of time that you, uh, you know, have them out in the heat of the day. Very quick walks and then right back in. If you have one of those breeds that is obviously more prone to heat issues like we talked about before, if you can, having them in an air-conditioned room, uh, that's really the best for them to kind of keep uh, that temperature and that stress on them as low as possible. Um, if you do have a dog that likes to be outside, during these temperatures, and some do. Uh, a couple of things to definitely remember is you definitely want to make sure there is some sort of shaded area for them. Uh, do not leave them in an area where there is absolutely no shade. That is a no-no. It is illegal, and you can get into a lot of trouble, not to mention the fact that it's it's cruel to do to your dog to do that. Um, but you definitely want to make sure there's a shaded area. They need plenty of cool water to be able to drink to help cool themselves off a little bit. Uh, and really, if you can avoid it, you don't want them out there for any length of time. It just exacerbates potential heat stress issues. Um, and uh, you just you just really try to avoid it if you can. But I do realize there's some times where that's unavoidable and you do have to do it. So, um, you know, keep that in mind. If you're the kind of per or person or you have a, a dog that really likes to go hiking with you and you like to go on long hikes, Really in the summer months, um, I try to dissuade people from from doing that um, and taking them on long hikes. And here is why. Uh, unless you're doing it in the real early morning or really late, you know, in the evening when it is maybe a little bit cooler out. But a lot of times, dogs that like going on hikes and that, and usually, you know, they are very loyal to you. And they will actually be so excited about being on the hike and being out there they will work themselves into a state of heat exhaustion and maybe even heat stroke 
it before they even really show signs. So they don't really show some of the classic signs that you see right off, and they just all of a sudden drop in a heat stroke uh, situation. And that can be very dangerous, obviously, because you're out on a hike, you're, you're not near your car in most cases, you can't get them to a veterinarian quickly. So really what we recommend in those situations is, you know, just kind of much as they want to go with you, if you want to go hiking, that's fine. Just really kind of leave the pooch at home. Um, you know, it'll just work out better for everybody. And, you know, give them a couple extra treats or, or things like that or a special treat uh, while you're gone and, uh, you know, everything will be okay. Yeah, as I said, you definitely want to try to keep the temperature in your house cool if you can. Um, you know, you certainly can consider using um, uh, air conditioning if you do have pets that enjoy being outside. Kitty pools are a great idea for dogs. Uh, they love to, to run and splash and play in those and that cool weather, cool water will help keep them cool uh, as things go on. So you certainly can do a lot of water activities with your pets and, and things like that to keep them cool. Uh, so all of those are kind of like general things, you know, that, that you want to be aware of uh, when keeping your pets uh, safe and healthy in the summer. One big thing that I think a lot of people don't think about when it comes to their pets as well, and this, this goes into walking, but um, with your dogs, is if whatever surface you're walking on, be it the beach, be it the pavement, be it a blacktop, be it anything, if it is too hot for your feet, it is too hot for your dog's feet. Um, I know people think that, you know, oh, well, they have pads and they're designed to protect and, and make things a lot better. Not, a, you know, really that's not the case. I, we have seen many instances of dogs having really, really severe burns on their feet uh, because they've been walked on hot pavement or even hot sand or things like that. So, if, you know, one test that we usually recommend to people is if you cannot keep your hand on the pavement for more than a couple of seconds before it gets too hot for you to bear, it's a problem for your dog. So avoid walking them on that. Try to walk them on grass. They do make booties and things like that for dogs. You know, uh, we obviously usually talk about that more in the winter uh, for protecting their paws, but you certainly can use them as well in the summer to help protect them from those hot surfaces. And it's something I think a lot of people don't realize, and sometimes burns don't show up right away on their pets, but they will notice all of a sudden that they don't want to walk. I mean, and it's just painful for them to put their feet down. Uh, and then we see them and we notice the burn marks, and it, it can be, you know, difficult to get some of those things treated sometimes, especially if it's on all four feet. So definitely keep all of that stuff in mind when you are um, uh, out walking with your dog. The next thing to kind of talk about, obviously, is hopefully you don't run into this situation, but you should know the basic signs that are out there when it comes to heat stress and heat stroke in your pet. And, you know, some of the early signs that we worry about are excessive panting. And this is not just the normal panting. This is kind of where they're focusing just on panting and they're not doing much else. And it's, it's kind of hard to describe, but it is a, a much deeper pant. Um, and, uh, you know, you can tell that they appear a little bit stressed while they're doing it. This is not just the normal walking up to you, Labrador panting because they're happy type of thing. You, you do notice a difference there. You start to notice that they are drooling excessively. And it's not, again, it's, it's not the same type of drool. It's a very thick, ropey drool that they have. That can be a sign that they are overheated uh, and starting to get into heat stress or heat stroke categories, which can be concerning. Um, as you kind of go on further down the line, if you notice that their gum color starts to change, usually we start to see a change to, instead of the normal pink, a very brick red color to their gums or their tongue, that can be a sign that they're really suffering from some heat stress or heat stroke. And then, uh, you know, if things continue to progress, we start to see signs where they appear to have um, incoordination or they're staggering. Um, they may not be able to right themselves. They appear trembling, things like that. And, that, and it can increase all the way up into seizures, activity, and, you know, potentially coma, uh, you know, which obviously is a life-threatening situation. Once you get to that point, hopefully you don't. Um, you know, if you do happen to be traveling with your dog, it's always a good idea to have a rectal thermometer on hand. Uh, you can get them from any drugstore. It's very easy to take your dog's temperature rectally. And, you know, once you start getting into uh, temperatures of your dog that hit that 105, 106, 107 range, that's when organ damage starts happening, and that's when we really start worrying about heat stroke and permanent damage and potential death. So, you know, if, if for some reason you see your dog's struggling and you take its temp and you see those temperatures, you want to make sure that you get them out of that situation right away. You start trying to cool them off, um, and you definitely try to get them to a veterinarian as quickly as possible so we can assess them and treat them uh, accordingly for heat stroke. If you are going to try to, to treat it a little bit, 
on your own, like you notice that your dog appears overheated um, and you want to try to do some things, obviously just getting them out of the situation to start and into an air conditioned area, um, you know, or uh, into even a shaded area out of the sun will go a long way towards helping. Um, just doing that will allow them to cool down a little bit and then some of their natural cooling mechanisms may take over as well. But the one thing you definitely don't want to do is you don't want to douse them with ice cold water. Uh, you know, many people think or, or immerse them in a bucket of ice water or things like that. A lot of people think, oh, that'll cool them down. It, it actually has a counter effect than what you would think because coldness constricts blood vessels. And one other way that dogs try to dissipate heat is they dilate blood vessels by their skin to help release some of that heat from the blood through the skin. Now, if you douse them in ice cold water, that causes all those vessels to constrict. So while their skin may feel cooler, and you may think you're doing a good job, what's actually happening is they're actually cooking higher inside because that heat has nowhere to go, so it keeps building up inside their body and their core, which can cause much more damage to a lot of organs, which again is something you, you definitely don't want to see. You can, you know, kind of hose them down a little bit with cool water. If they can drink and they're not vomiting or anything like that, you can offer them, again, cool water, not ice cold water, because it can have a counter effect. After that, you definitely want to, you know, get to a veterinary hospital, either your nearest emergency clinic or your veterinarian, as quickly as possible. We have other ways through intravenous fluids and, and some other lavage techniques to cool them down appropriately, um, uh, you know, uh, if we do see them in that condition. And really, sometimes, unfortunately, they get to us and it's too late. I mean, they're, you know, the damage is already done and there's not a lot we can do as vets, which is why we are so disheartened when we see some of these cases because we know a lot of times they're preventable. And of course, the, one, the, 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 the biggest thing that we obviously and everybody harps on every year, and that is 100% preventable, of course, is never leaving an animal in a car in the summer. And it doesn't matter if they're in the shade, it doesn't matter if the windows are cracked, it doesn't matter if it only seems like it's 75, 80 degrees out, um, as some of the charts that you're seeing here show, even for five or 10 minutes, if it's 80 degrees in your car, you may think it's not too bad, but look at how quickly that temperature can spike uh, and affect your dog. So, and everybody's seen the videos out there, you know, of uh, vets that have locked themselves in cars to show uh, how severe it can get and all of those other things. So, you know, just don't do it. And this doesn't go just for dogs, this goes for any animal. You know, you, you really don't want to leave them in a parked car at all. Cats can overheat just as quickly. Um, you know, small pocket pets, small mammals can overheat just as quickly. And they all can suffer deadly heat stroke when these things happen. So please, 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 we, we, we preach it every year. And thankfully now, in a lot of states, the laws are changing, which allows police to just break windows and go in and get your animal out. And I can tell you, if you do it, and they catch you and it's it's against the law or it's against the regulations in the state or, or town that you're in, you are going to get nailed and you are going to get fined and you're gonna get charged with cruelty and you should. I mean, you know, that's that's really the way it is. Uh, you, there's just no excuse for doing that. If you do, obviously have somebody else with you, have the car running, have air conditioning going in the car if you absolutely have to do that, but do not leave a, an animal in a parked car alone no matter what for any amount of time in the summer because it will not end well. Uh, and again, we see cases of it year after year after year, and it is the 100% most preventable so, uh, cause of heat stroke uh, and death in animals that, that, that is out there. So just don't do it. So that kind of covers a lot of the, you know, the basics when it comes to heat, uh, heat stroke, heat stress, and, and preventing those things from happening in your pets. Again, I, I talked a little bit about large animals, uh, you know, horses and cows, they're, they're all kind of different. Some, there are some breed variations in there. So you want to talk to your vet about keeping them cool, things you can do, signs of potential heat stroke or heat stress in those animals. Uh, you know, a lot of people have gone to these misting systems that work really well in barns and out in paddocks, even for horses and, and, and livestock. Uh, you know, obviously, if you have things like sheep or goats, uh, you know, if it's really hot out, you don't want to work them. Uh, you don't want to run them through chutes to do anything to them. Really, you want to try to wait until it uh, uh, gets a little bit cooler because they, that can have a really detrimental heat, str heat stress effect on them. So keep that in mind if you happen to be one who has, you know, larger animals or farm animals. And with that, it kind of brings us to everybody's favorite part of the program. It is Doc's Top 5 Sizzling hot takeaways on this episode of Driving with Doc. So 
let's get right to it and recap things with the top five things I think are most important for everybody to remember when it comes to uh, preventing heat related illnesses in your pets and we're going to start with number one and that of course is know the breed of animal that you have as a pet and what you're dealing with uh, and if you do you can know that certain breeds, as we said, are much more prone to heat stress and heat stroke and uh, having difficulty in hot situations. So you can obviously plan accordingly and take the necessary precautions. Number two, you wanna make sure that in general, you take all the proper precautions for preventing any kind of heat related illness in your pet. So you know, as we talked about walking them early in the morning, later in the evening, avoiding the, the hottest part, parts of the day, very, very short walks if they are going out uh, you know, in the middle of the day, making sure that if they are outside for any period of time, they definitely have shade, they have plenty of cool water to drink. Um, you know, trying to avoid taking them on any kind of extended hikes or anything like that uh, and just kind of leaving them home to enjoy the cool weather and obviously if you have any of those heat stress prone animals, uh, you know, taking the proper precautions with them as well. Number tres. If it is too hot for you to walk barefoot on a surface, it is too hot for your dog. And again, this is one that we think a lot of people don't think about, but we do see pretty severe burns on dogs' feet sometimes from walking on very, very hot surfaces. We have shoes on, we don't think about it. If you can't keep your hand on the pavement for a couple of seconds, uh, it is too hot for your dog. So do not expose them to those surfaces. Number four. Make sure that you know the basic signs of heat stress and potentially heat stroke in animals. And if you start to see any of those signs, if you happen to have a thermometer with you and you notice those temperatures starting to skyrocket, definitely do some things to try to cool them off. And again, cool water, not cold water or ice cold water. Um, and then obviously getting them to a veterinarian as soon as you possibly can so that we can assess them and potentially treat them as needed. And finally, number five, the one that I wish we did not have to say every year, but never, ever, 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 ever leave a dog in a hot car or a cat in a car, parked car, hot car, or any animal in a hot car, a parked car, a child. Don't do that either. You know, just use some common sense. Don't do it, even if it seems like you're only gonna be in for a couple of seconds and it doesn't seem that hot out. Trust me, temperatures can get very hot very quickly and you can be in a bad situation and your pet can be in a far worse situation. So just don't do it. So those are Doc's top five sizzling hot takeaways on this episode of Driving with Doc. Hope we kind of refreshed everybody's memory about a lot of the things that you need to be aware of when it comes to uh, uh, you know, heat stress in your pets. And of course, if you have any questions about anything in this episode or uh, heat stress in general, heat stroke in general, you certainly can drop us a line at drivingwithdoc at gmail.com. Again, drivingwithdoc at gmail.com. I will do my best to try to answer them. And uh, if you have any topic suggestions for future shows, we certainly love them as well. So you can drop them at that email. You can drop them in the comments section. Uh, wherever you want to put them, I will certainly find a way to see them. So that is about going to do it for this episode episode of Driving with Doc. Again, thanks for coming along on this early evening drive. And again, the time of day when you want to definitely be walking your dogs in the summer to uh, make things a little bit easier on them heat-wise. And hope everybody is staying cool, staying safe. Again, uh, you, during hot times, you want to check on pets, you want to check on the elderly, check on everybody, make sure they're doing okay. And uh, everybody will have a happy and healthy summer. So until next time, enjoy the summer, enjoy the wonderful festivities that involve the summer. And uh, of course, we will be seeing you next time as we go on a drive with Doc.